Um, so without further ado, um, we're joined tonight by Luke Tokashu uh, from LTD Wines in Coonawarra and uh, Nigel Ludlow from Art by Evoy in Margaret River. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it'll be great to get a little bit of an introduction into who they are and um, a bit about Cabernet from their particular regions and see, um, see which is... Which is um, the most preferred uh, of the of the two. Um, so I'll hand it over to Luke first of all, and he can tell you a little bit about himself and how he got into wine and how he how uh, how, how the LTD business is running and um, a little bit more about Kunawara Cabernet. So over to you, Luke. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Uh, hello, everyone, and happy Thursday. I hope you've all got your glasses of wine handy. I certainly do. Um, so thanks for joining us. Um, my wine journey, I guess, started um, when I was born, born into the wine industry. Uh, my father, Patrick, was a winemaker. Uh, I was born in Adelaide and um, spent the first five years of my life in the Barossa. And then we moved down to Coonawarra when I was about uh, four, nearly five, and have basically been in Coonawarra ever since. Um, I went away to university for uh, four years to study winemaking and then um, came back to the region after working at a few other wineries around the country and overseas for a little while and uh, came back to the family business. Uh, we have vineyards here in Kurnawara uh, and also in Rattanbully, which is about half an hour north of here. And uh, we purchased those vineyards, or the family purchased the vineyards when my dad first moved down to Coonawarra. He was a winemaker for Holic Wines, which is literally just across the road from us. And during that time as a winemaker, he purchased that vineyard and started um, growing the grapes. And then the grapes would be going into the wines wherever he was working at the time. Um, fast forward, he opened our own business, so the winery started in 2004. Um, our first release was a 1998 Cabernet, so we'd been making wine um, in preempting opening cellar door a little bit after that. So um, fast forward, I came back from university, uh, worked around the country, and then came back to give my dad a hand in, in the winery and in, in the, the wine business. Um, probably a little bit earlier than I would have hoped. I was happy traveling around and, you know, doing, um, doing that sort of vintage winemaker thing, which is, is a really good opportunity for us in, in our career to be able to travel, go overseas, work for six months, come back to another vintage year and, and get a lot of experience. But dad needed a bit of help in the business and, and I came back uh, in 1999. So, Luckily, um, had a few vintages working with my dad. Uh, he unfortunately then got cancer and passed away about a year later. So he passed away in 2013. We'd had a couple of years working together, um, being able to sort of me learn from him and, and see how he did it from the, the 40 years of experience that he had in the wine industry. And I brought to the table that sort of little bit of uh, young knowledge, that scientific background being just coming straight out of university. And you know, he used to just taste the wine and say, oh yeah, it needs a bit of this or it needs a bit longer in oak or that sort of thing where I was probably a bit more scientific based and relied a lot on the, looking at the numbers and uh, making sure that the lab analysis is all correct before I make my wine. Um, and having that time with him before he passed away was uh, sort of crucial for me to then step up uh, as a 27 year old to start making the wine for myself. And probably the more challenging part is actually running the, the wine business. So took over from there, we've got about uh, eight staff here at the time. And um, that, was a, that was probably the biggest learning curve trying to uh, juggle not only making the wine, but running the business as well. Um, that's sort of when we touched base with uh, Naked Wines and um, reached out to Paul. And we'd actually had dealings with Paul, with Paul before in his uh, previous career as we had been dealing with them. And then, um, so we had a bit of a history together and um, it was 
uh, yeah, basically worked in quite well. They were growing quite well at the time. I think there was about 20 odd winemakers when I joined. So um, it was pretty early on, about five, five years ago, you know, six years ago now. And uh, I started with one wine and that was a, a Kunawara Cabernet. Um, and basically Naked Wines came along at that perfect opportunity where, you know, I was sort of struggling to, to run the business and uh, promote the wine and get out there. Um, and obviously starting from uh, a small base with one wine on Naked Wines and now uh, uh, expanded to about six. So it came at a great time for us to sort of grow together, um, me making the wine and really um, bring that new dynamic to a new range of wines, which is one that I can really sort of put my own stamp on. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy to be here today to talk a bit about Kunawara and, uh, and the wines that we make there. Cool, thanks mate. Um, just a quick question we've got um, from Paul. He asks you um, what the best memory and lesson learned from your dad was. Well, I think the best lesson was probably making making Riesling. Um, Riesling's a very challenging variety to make and dad made a huge amount of Riesling uh, through the Eden Valley and um, in the Barossa in his early days. And um, there's a real sort of hands-off um, approach to making Riesling, but uh, it's quite a delicate variety to work with. So um, certainly learned some tips and tricks um from him then and um i think some of the best memories were um right sort of uh closer to when he passed away he was quite sick and we actually picked up some pretty big trophies one trophy at the adelaide wine show for riesling which is uh, you know a very proud moment of the wine that we made together and uh one of those memories that i'll certainly cherish so, yeah Fantastic, fantastic. All right, we better get uh, Nigel just to introduce himself. <clears throat> Nigel? Yeah, g'day. Uh, Nigel Ludlow uh, by Voy. So a bit about my history. You can probably tell by the accent. I was, I was born in New Zealand. So I've only been in Australia about 20 years. So I've probably got another 20 or 30 before I become officially Australian. Um, and the rugby team had better play a bit better before that happens. Um, so born in New Zealand and then quite quickly got into the uh, flying winemaker thing. Just luckily I had a mate doing it. So, yeah, just very fortunate. Managed to go to um, Spain, um, South Africa, Hungary and um, back to New Zealand, then over to Australia. Uh, I did a degree in nutrition, so that, that was the plan. I was going to be a nutritionist or a sports nutritionist. And that, that didn't really happen. I, I didn't feel it. So after a few years of just playing around, I went back and did a winemaking degree. Um, and, yeah, never regretted it. it it's hard work, but uh, just awesome fun. And, yeah, I, I, I think... If you've got the passion, then it's going to work. You, you're going to make it work. So anyway, did that. Um, you only live once, I figure, so you might as well make it interesting. So on the way to Spain, the first time I did a, um, I went to Cuba and learned Spanish at the University of Havana, and that's where I met my first wife. So... Um, yeah, we were happily married for quite a while and I've got my beautiful daughter here with me at the moment. Um, but, yeah, that, that didn't last forever and just, I, yeah, whatever happened, I got married again to a, a Jamaican lass. So we've got a little boy um, over in Jamaica at the moment. So they've been stuck there for a couple of months. And what else? Then I, so I moved to Margaret River. Well, I was working in uh, Blenheim, actually, in Marlborough, making a mountain at Sauve Blanc. And it got too cold for me. It just, I, I don't like it. It was just freezing cold. So I thought, where can I go for somewhere a bit warmer? So I flew over and the plan was McLaren Vale or Margaret River. And I didn't really get into McLaren Vale, but 
as soon as I came into Margaret River, I was blown away by by everything, by the beaches, by by just yeah the grapes uh, just blown away so after that weekend flight we decided to move the family over to australia so that that was about 20 years ago and wine making so I, i've basically started with nothing i i came when we landed from spain into australia i was just starting to build a house and i had no job no nothing so my first job was i worked for about two weeks at lewin estate and then went to another winery called Flying Fish. And from there, got a got another winemaking job, which I was there for about 10 years. And it was run by accountants and I, was, I was, didn't enjoy it much at all. So that, that's actually where I met Mark. And it was very, very money driven. And I did, yeah, I just had to kind of let the passion out somewhere. So I started my own label, which didn't make any sense at all. So I started two barrels in 07. And from there, I just grew it slowly, but it good, got good traction. And really the, the main event happened in 2013, where I had to leave my current job and I had no, still really no money. Um, and that, that's where uh, about then, um, naked wines really, helped so that just gave me legs so i could actually make the brand into something more than um just a play thing and where are we now so now we've got art by voy um and a winery and a cellar door so yeah i feel very very blessed amazing <clears throat> Amazing. So, um, well, why don't we get stuck into Cabernet? Because um, both Coonawarra and Margaret River are renowned for it. Um, why don't we kick it off and throw it around? So, what, what, Luke? You can you can start. Um, why Coonawarra and why Cabernet? Um, start from the beginning, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Coonawarra has got a pretty long history of, of making wine. Uh, the first grapes in Coonawarra were planted in 1891. Coonawarra um, was actually established as a fruit colony. So um, there was uh, some fruit trees planted uh, and then they worked out for whatever reason, these fruit trees were growing really well. So they started planting uh, more different um, different fruit trees and then expanded that into, into vineyards eventually. Um, and they discovered this lovely little strip uh, of soil across the middle of Coonawarra. So uh, it's called the Terra Rossa strip of soil. So it runs about 15 kilometers long through the middle of Coonawarra. And it's only about two kilometers wide. Uh, on the east of us is quite uh, sandy soil and then on the west is quite a sort of swampy clay soil and they actually discovered that the highway runs down the right down the middle of the of the strip and people have always say you know, this is the best vineyard country why is there a road running down the middle of Kunawara? but it was the only place where the horse and cart wouldn't get bogged in the in the winter and in the summer so in the summer they'd get stuck in the sand and then in the winter they'd get stuck in the mud so this this thin, thin strip of soil was where the, the highway actually um, was established. Um, the reason the, because uh, they didn't get bogged was basically that the soil structure is a um, shallow terra rossa soil being a clay loamy soil on the top. So quite shallow, anywhere from 30 centimetres down to about a metre, metre and a half before you hit sort of solid limestone. And the limestone underneath is very sort of porous and allows all that water to drain through. Um, over, over the years of trying different grape varieties, Coonawarra was initially established on more Shiraz than, than Cabernet uh, and mostly fortified wine. So back in the sort of uh, early century, they were doing all the wines for fortifieds and brandies. And then it wasn't until about the 60s when they started producing more table wines as we know these today. 
and um, basically that 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 terrorosal strip of soil allows the vines to feed off the first shallow layer um, and get a little bit of nutrient, but without being uh, too vigorous and not growing too too much. Uh, Cabernet doesn't like to grow too much. You get a lot of sort of shaded green characters if it's uh, the canopy's too large. Uh, and then the free draining soil just lets it, that water just drain straight away, so the the roots are sort of always dry, and um, and it just makes for growing really good cabernet. You really want <clears throat> um, vines to to struggle, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's a, a reproductive it's bizarre, but yeah. mechanism of the vine. Yeah, they want to put all their energy in the fruit, so the birds carry the fruit away and and reproduce basically. So. Um, yeah, as a winemaker, we, we actually stress the vines more and more closer to the, the end of harvest to make sure all that energy is going into the grapes. Cool. Uh, Nigel, before we um, get on to Margaret River, I've just got a question here from Alicia, um, who says, wine seems like a glamorous industry to be in. Is it always as good, as, a, good as good a life as it looks to everyone else? Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing the couple of the stories that you were talking to us about earlier. Oh, sorry, me. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, glamorous, no, it's about the most unglamorous job in the world. Like um, in the morning I go mm -hmm. to this, well, it's not concrete, but mo most of them are concrete factories and um, the glamorous bit is drinking it and playing around with barrels. So that, that's about the only glamour. There, there's a lot of pumping and um, manual labour. Like, I, I don't know how many more years I can do it. I'm just about worn out. <laughs> there's a lot of heavy lifting and, and grunt work. So um, I'm going to have to employ somebody a bit younger than me. <laughs> um and yeah what what happened so to, everything's happening at the moment um there, there's yeah, mistakes that can happen at the moment anyway I, I went to the winery this morning and there's there's no power because our whole power board's out so um and you're planning on bottling the art by evoy chardonnay is that no, right? we did a bottling yeah so we're bottling the 19 art by evoy chardonnay and only because i've got a um a generator so we're running the generator and i've got about a million it, it was uh, this morning it was a very, very just one step at a time thing first of all i thought okay i need hot water to sterilize the um the bottling line so i ran an extension cord out to the Renai unit to get the hot water and then I realised, shit, I'm, I haven't got any water. So I'd, I'd run another extension cord out, out to the water pump. And all this in the dark. Um, but, but we got it going. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, we smashed out about 11 pallets of, of Chardonnay today. So, good. Fantastic, fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about Margaret River and <clears throat> why it's, you know, it, it's, it's renowned for Cabernet? Yeah, the, the interesting thing about Margaret River, it's, it's very long and skinny region. So you get a lot of different wines in the one region. Like you've got North Margaret River, um, Yelverton Way, where, where it is. It's quite warm and you get, yeah, you know, it's a lot better for red grapes. And then you've got down the southern bit of Margaret River, which is not good for red grapes and better, better for like Savoy Sam. And then you've got the middle bit, which is kind of where I hang around, and that's uh, Willie Abra. And that, that's got uh, more of the big name wineries, but it's got a beautiful soil too, just an ancient loamy soil. And the uh, vineyard where my grapes come from, uh, it's got a very rocky, extremely rocky. And there's actually a pile of rocks, probably as big as a two-storied house that they've dragged from the ground so that they can put the, put the vines in. And it's a uh, coffee rock, so quite a, quite a volcanic rock. So basically just a very ancient soil and, and a bit like Kunawara, if you get that patch, then you're very, very lucky. Um, um, yep. Yeah, and, and we can do a few varieties just from the length 
and yeah, that, there's a bit more than soil. It's it's really climate defines quite a bit in Nagel River. Sure. Um, we've also just got a couple of questions from a couple of people um, uh, wanting to know where art by Evoy comes from. What 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 does it mean? Well, um, my label is Evoy, and what I wanted to do for Naked was kind of push the passion side of it. So the art by Evoy was um, it's art in the bottle. Um, so I've got a on the label here. You can see it here. Um, so it's just a frame with no art inside it. So the, the art is inside the bottle. That, that's what the label is all about. Poetic. <laughs> um, okay. Um, can you so I mean, can you sort of describe what um, a Margaret River Cabernet is like for those that haven't tried them? Yeah, M Margaret River Cabernet is mind blowing and life changing. It, it's so not not, not nothing special. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's the reason that I came to Margaret River. That and the Chardonnay and Margaret River Chardonnay and Cabernet are just phenomenal. And and Margaret River, I've been in a few different countries, and it really is world beating. Um, the Cabernet. It's quite distinctive. I, t I think the whole thing about Margaret River is power. Like, it's just got so much power in the wine. No matter what variety you're talking about, it's just got got this essence. It's, it's almost like, you know, you look out at the ocean, you see these big rollers coming in. That, that's what the Margaret River wine's like, um, especially the Cabernet. It's just got waves of flavour, just incredible. Um, uh, descriptors, I'd, I'd say it's got, yeah, typical cassis and Cab Sav shouldn't just be big juicy fruit, it should have, like Cab Sav um, should have a bit of sauvage, so a bit of, bit of greenness, a bit of savageness to it. And the way Margaret River does that, it's more in kind of a bit of bay leaf and a bit of um, capsicum, like red capsicum. <clears throat> But yeah, so apart from descriptors, it's more about the power and the, and the balance. It's not a big, like Barossa Shiraz, it's got elegance. So I, I think the defining thing about Mug River is no matter how big it is, it's got this um, elegance to it. Yeah, elegance and intensity, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Luke, what, what would you, how would you describe Pinot Noir Cabernet? Um, I think Kunawara generally is a little bit cooler than Margaret River. So we have this wonderful savoury element to the wine. And I think elegance really sums up Kunawara wine. I mean, I've been lucky enough to have some wines from Kunawara from, you know, the 50s and the 60s. And, and they're still really elegant, drinkable wines, even, you know, 50 years later. Um, the tannin structure is just lovely and soft but the length on the wines is just amazing. Uh, it's backed up by that lovely, lovely fruit character, but also that spice and sort of that little bit of mintiness. So uh, I think it's one of the only wines in the world that you can sort of pick up uh, and say in a lineup and say, you know, that's a Pernod Wara wine. So it's got this mintiness, that underlying uh, tannin structure and, and spice to it, that uh, they are really unique and they, they stand out in a, in a lineup of, Cabernets from around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we've also got uh, a couple of questions about vintage, um, which is best, and uh, do you have a favourite, and all that sort of stuff. Can you give a little bit of insight into, uh, I, I guess, what, what what vintage is, and then why they differ, and and are there better ones than than others? Yeah. So when we talk about vintage, um, you know, that's that's the year that the grapes are picked, um, and one of the joys of being a winemaker is that every year is very different. Uh, we get thrown different challenges. Uh, one wine we make one year is never going to be exactly the same as the next year. So that, that whole sort of artistic element um, really comes into play. In Kurnawara, historically, you know, a good rule of thumb is the even years have been the best. So right back to sort of the like 
mid nineties onwards. So anything with an even year has generally been pretty good. There's a few anomalies in there. You know, some of the, the odd years have been really good. Um, but you know, vines tend to have that sort of cycle as our weather patterns do. So um, generally, you know, anything that's um, you know even year is a pretty good bet from Kurnawa. Is, is, is it true if it's, it's it, I mean, Kunawara is a cool region as it is. If, if it's a bit too cool, uh, generally they don't get ripe. They don't, there's not enough flavour. They're, they're generally the, 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 the vintages that are a little, you know, below par. Yeah, I think the, the major consideration here is, um, is the weather as it gets cooler. Um, the longer the, the, the grapes stay on the vine, the generally the better it is in Kunawara. So the cooler years have been historically good. Uh, it's when we have a cool and wet year, um, that's when we get diluted flavours and you know, struggle to actually ripen the, gray, the grapes. This year, for instance, we had quite a cool year and you know, I only finished picking, um, was the last week in April. So I've still got one ferment in the winery that's sitting on skin. So that's nearly probably, apart from Tasmania, would be one of the last places to pick in Australia for sure. So yeah. uh, the time on the vine really gives the, the wines extra time to give uh, build that flavour and, and complexity up. Yeah. Uh, Nige, as a comparison, w w when did you finish your vintage? Well, I'll just make you jealous, Luke. Um, <laughs> just, just about all my reds have finished Malo now. But I, I do the co-inoculation thing. But, um, yeah, they're, they're basically all through. I've got a couple of Chardonnay barrels still to go. So we, chalk and cheese, we, we had a um, super early vintage. We, we were probably a month ahead of uh, where we normally are for vintage, which is really weird because it wasn't, you know, there's you know, global warming and whatnot, but I, I didn't really notice it, to be honest. It didn't seem like a hot summer but we, we were suddenly into picking fruit in January. You know, normally we're Very early, wasn't late it? Feb, March, but we, we were full on in, in January. Um, and what, um, vintage wise, we... Um, Do you have a favorite vintage? Yeah, that, that's the thing about Margaret River, it's, Pretty consistent. We're, we're very lucky. Like just about every <laughs> vintage is good. We're, we've got a big sea influence, and it seems to dissipate any big variations in, in the in the climate. Um, so now we, we've had a couple of bad years in the last. I, I'd say we've had two bad years in the last twenty years, since, uh, the last fifteen years since I've been here. And they were pretty bad, but um, we're, we're very lucky. It's very moderate climate here, so so we don't get the big variations. Fantastic. Um, anything else you want to add about Cabernet, or should we talk about a, a hidden gem that you might have for from the region? Uh, I'm drinking the 2016 LTD Cabernet. Don't know if you can see that very well. 2016. Um, I like to release my Cabernet a little bit older, so it is fairly uh, one of the older wines you will find on, on Naked Wines, which um, I've managed to be able to do with Pole from the start, sort of release that older vintage and really run that um, part of my philosophy in, in winemaking is to sort of delay release and release the wine a little bit older than, um, than, than most would, um, just to allow it to soften and um, you know, most wine is drunk within 24 hours of, of purchasing it these days. So um, getting it um, pre-aged for you gives people that experience of what I think Green Warra Cabernet should should be like. And it, and it really does the region and the wine justice. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> nice. Do you want to talk to your, your wine? Yeah, I, do. I think big kudos like especially with Cabernet, the more age you can give it, the better it's going to be. It's just such a beautiful ageing wine. Um, so, yeah, I've got a uh, current release coming up is the um, is the 18 Mug River 
cab. So um, eighteen was probably our best ever vintage hair ever. <laughs> Uh, it was just the perfect vintage. There's no vintage better than 2018, I, I think, even historically. Um, so ho hopefully that reflects um, the good vintage. Um, what, what, I mean, you, you talk about the best vintage. Is, is it a wine that people should, I mean, they can drink it now, obviously, but would you recommend you know, laying some down for a little bit of time and what, how long would that be? I'd, I'd definitely recommend laying it down. Um, the older you can drink it, the better. I'd, I'd give this wine 20 years. Wow. It, it's only going to get better and better. Um, it's, again, just really good fruit and it's just structured. So it'll just keep going. So no, no rush angels to drink it. Um, take your time but in saying that of course it's drinking good now so fantastic and um luke with with your uh 2016 um it, it's ready to drink now but um would you also could you also put it down if you wanted to yeah i definitely i think um it will reward those that do put it down so i always say you know when you buy a case you you drink one every year until you hit that magical spot that you like and then you drink the rest of your taste. So, um, yeah, it's a, one you can put away and, and certainly um, if you get the opportunity to taste a, an aged Cabernet, you know, you certainly uh, a different experience. So, can you just, you know, in layman's terms, ex explain the difference between, say, you know, 10 years, what, what happens to the wine? Yeah, so um, after probably five to six years, you're starting to see that the tannins uh, are actually joining together and, and dropping out of solution. So you're seeing, you know, a little bit of crust that might form on the bottle. That's perfectly natural. And all that is, is the, uh, the tannins actually falling out. And that has the effect of softening the wine. So it softens, uh, it hasn't got as much astringency to it. Um, that mouth but, puckering sort of sensation. Yeah. yeah, that puckering sort of tannic taste. Um, but it also, you're getting a, a secondary flavours that are coming in. And uh, in Kurnawara, we get a lot of sort of leather and cigar box and those sort of secondary characters which we talk about. So you've still got the, your fruit characters, which we talk about being primary fruit characters, and then secondary underlying flavours being those that sort of that lovely leathery par character and um, almost a, a uh, real savoury note to the wine. And, um, you know, wonderful food match as well with an aged Cabernet. It's got such a versatile wine when you do have that aged um, wine. Is that, is that the same for Marga River, Nigel? Um, yeah, it is. We, we've got a bit more of that kind of dull pepper um, coming through in it, um, bay leaf. But... Yeah, I, I think the acid structure is pretty awesome too. We've got got the right balance of acids so that it, it can just keep going on and on and on. Um, yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Yep. Um, okay, well... Is there anything else you wanted to talk about Cabernet or should we, should we talk about your hidden gem that you want to uh, talk about? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you crack on? Gem, Luke. Uh, mine is Riesling. So uh, Kunawara Riesling. Um, there is about, you know, there's only 25 wineries in Kunawara, So it's quite a small sort of tightly kept um, region, but, the, there's about 12 producers of Riesling from Kurnawara. We are actually quite cool climate. So Riesling is very much suited to cool climate. You've got to, you've got to treat Riesling a little bit differently than you would Cabernet. Riesling generally on not on terra off the soil is better. Uh, on the darker soil, Riesling likes um, to grow a little bit more um, and shade the fruit a little bit more so you're getting some nice lime citrus characters um, but 
yeah, it's a beautiful balance. I would normally say you've got sort of the, that Clare Valley uh, Riesling is a lot more citrus and um, that crisp acidity. Uh, Kunawara has got this lovely sort of floral character to the Riesling, uh, which is quite generous, that sort of apple blossom, um, almost like sweetness on the, on the nose. And uh, again, something that, that ages really well. I love aged Riesling as well. One you can put in the cellar for 20 years and, and bring it, bring out and it's completely different wine. You, so someone an aged Riesling and you know you won't even be able to determine what variety it is it's got these lovely sort of posty characters that come out um, which is a real hidden thing in a while. Fantastic we've got Steve Talbot saying he thinks it's a it's an absolutely cracking drop one of the archangels from Naked. Um, yep. Nigel how about yourself? Yeah, somebody pointed out it's not really that hidden, but um, it, it's certainly a, a gem. Um, I'm a big, Dark River really does the classics well, and I, I struggled to kind of get away from them. Like Margaret River really does Cabernet, Chardonnay, Sablon, Sem, just so well. And my, my hidden gem is the um, Margaret River, Sablon, Sem. And I think people get a bit confused. Like there's a bit of a trend going away from blends, but really you make a blend because you put bits together and, and the, you make something better than the bits coming into it. So I, I really don't understand that. Whenever you come across a blend, you should just accept it as probably better than the some of the parts coming into it. Yeah. Um, like lots of people, it's a real new world thing that you buy a Shiraz or you buy a Cabernet or you buy a Sav Blanc. But people have been doing these blends for years. Like Market River was founded on basically it had the same climate as Bordeaux. So a, a lot of Market River is on the Bordeaux varietals like Cabernet, oops, not Chardonnay, <laughs> Sav Blanc, Sem. Um, and, and that, that's my gem, the Sablon Sem. It's a Bordeaux classic. It's been around, it's probably one of the first ever blends, you know, Sav Blanc and Semillon. It's just such a good mix. And I, I think it's incredible. And that's coming from a Kiwi that's fat out Semillon. I, I don't understand <laughs> Semillon at all. Margaret but, River Semillon, though, is quite different to, say, Hunter Valley Semillon, isn't it? Yeah, and I still don't understand it. I, I know, I do not understand Margaret River Semillon, but I, I know when you blend it with Sav Blanc, it just adds such good longevity to the wine. Like a Sav Blanc can die after one, two years, but a Sav Blanc Sem can go for 10 years. You know, you get so much more life out of it and, and structure and it just makes a whole new different wine. And... Yeah, I, I think Sablon Sem is a fantastic ageing wine. What, what I do is add a bit of oak to it as well, a bit of a barrel ferment. And that um, just gives it structure and, and length as well. So it, it, it can be a, an awesome wine. Awesome. Uh, just quickly, Luke, um, Riesling, is that sweet? Oh, no, Riesling can be all kinds of things. It can be really sweet or it can be really dry. So um, my Riesling, I'd put it in the sort of dry to off dry spectrum. So I like to leave a little bit of sugar in there just to take the edge off the acid when it's a, a, a young wine. Um, but it's only, you know, five or six grams per litre. So like not much at all, but just enough, enough, uh, not enough to taste, but just enough to sort of soften it a little bit. But yeah, Riesling is, is uh, you know, that's the number one question. Um, people come into Celador and say, oh, we'd like to try the Riesling. Oh, no, I don't like sweet wine. And we say, well, Riesling's got, you know, so many hats that it wears that, you know, you have to try Riesling. And, and, and that's, you know, it's a very misunderstood variety. And, you know, it's probably suffered from a lot of the, you know, bag in box days where anything sweet was called Riesling, um, Fruity Lexia, uh, Moselle and those sort of things were all sort of sweet Riesling style. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think um, 
once you have tasted it, uh, once you find a, a good Riesling, whether it be sweet or dry, and yeah, you uh, should keep drinking it. Uh, I've got a question, Mark. <laughs> sure, mate. Fire away. Look, Luke, do you put a sweetness indicator on your label or do Naked put a sweetness indicator on anything? No, no. Um, on the Naked website, it has the, your sweet spot scale, so that'll basically tell you if, if you're going to like it or not, which is the beauty of, of the website. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, once people have bought it, um, then they can have a look at the label, with it, but it won't have a, a sweetness indicator on it. Cool. Okay. Well, I've got a, a lot of questions, so um, let's start at the top. Um, Paul Berry asks what the best temperature to hold his reds is. 18 degrees. 18 degrees. Yeah. In our, uh, in our, most of your sort of climate control fridges and things, I'd sort of recommend 18 degrees for reds and about 16 for white. And, and the, the, the most, probably the most important thing is, is that constant temperature, isn't it? As opposed to cool or, uh, or warmer, it's, it's that consistent. Yeah. Certainly. If you're in, um, you know, warmer, humid climate, anywhere in Queensland, I'd definitely uh, the humidity sort of has a, has a bit of effect as well. But yeah, that uh, change in temperature. So if you're cellaring at home or in your apartment or something like that, you know, the, probably the best spot is in the middle of the house under the stairs or uh, in a cup at the back of a cupboard um, where it's not going to get, you know, that huge change in temperature and yep. yeah, fine. Um, and Carol asks, <clears throat> um, how do you think this year's drought and bushfires will affect your vintage, if at all? I'd, I'll, I'll just go first quickly because we haven't had a drought or uh, bush fire this year, but um, I do a Blackwood Valley label for for Naked and the vineyard, I, I should post some shots, the vineyard got burnt out. Um, it didn't produce one year. So the fire came right down to the, to the vineyard and there was nothing produced from that year. It was horrific. Most of, uh, a lot of Blackwood Valley got, got burnt out. Um, and and then there was frost as well, so it was horrific. Wow. Yeah, I think we're we're the same here in Kurnawara. We didn't have any any fire issues or drought issues. We were actually really lucky. Um, you know, there's Victoria had quite a few bushfires, and uh, most of the Victorian regions were wiped out. And even through Adelaide Hills and Barossa, there's a lot of smoke damage. Um, but uh, here we were, we were pretty, pretty well off. And weather-wise, we've had a, um, we had quite a wet April this year. So uh, it was actually quite a challenge to pick in between rainfall. So um, generally, we're we're pretty immune from from the drought this far sort of south. Cool. Um, both. Trevor and John um, are interested in how COVID-19 crisis has impacted your business. <clears throat> Nige, do you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, first? it's um, interesting. <sighs> um, yeah, well, the main, main effect is no cellar door, so that, that's a big loss um, each month. But I, I think Australia's done it well that they tackled it and hopefully we can open up um, sooner rather than later. Um, so at the moment we can do takeaways from the cellar door, but we can't do tastings. So it's basically closed, but people can, um, can come and get takeaways. So, yeah, and a, even during vintage, it was quite interesting. Like basically... I'm really a one-man band, but I've, I've got somebody helping me. Um, and it was like self-isolation in the winery. Yeah, that, that's how we, we took it. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity like for us as winemakers. I mean, vintage is very self-isolated anyway. We're 
often in the winery or in a vineyard uh, without any people. So um, I guess, yeah, for me, so a door being shut is probably something that I wasn't uh, going to predict early and um, something I probably just didn't think would ever happen in my lifetime. But uh, luckily we're allowed to open on the 5th of June. So um, not too far away from now. And South Australia has been uh, pretty good. We haven't had any cases for um, 28 days or one in 28 days. So um, it's been pretty good. So hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll be back on track pretty soon. Um, uh, so just to go back on the smoke, um, Carol asks, can you define what smoke damage would be or could be? Yeah, okay. And I've, I've experienced it twice. Um, the first time was the vineyard was just smoke damage. So the um, government agency burned off around the vineyard and the smoke, well, right up to the vineyard again, actually, and, and the smoke and soot, etc., landed on the grapes. So we, I'd, I tried to make a, a few wines out of it, a Pinot and a Rose. I ended up trying to make a Rose out of everything just because the, the skins had so much crap on it. We just tried to get the fruit, yeah, the juice out of the fruit as quick as we could. And, yes, yeah, so it's really interesting. Some people pick up smoke taint, in a, in a second and other people can't. So it'd be interesting people coming up to the tanks and they'd go, oh, this is a nice rosé. And then other people would go, oh, what the hell have you done to this? It's bloody, it smells like smoke. So it, it's real challenge. It, it can, well, it, it normally just ruins the fruit. Um, you have to be very careful to produce a wine from it. And the other thing too, with time that the smoke tank can come out so you might think you're, you're lucky and you've produced a pretty okay wine, but after a few months or even a year, the smoke taint is going to increase. So it's very, very risky. Cool. Um, uh, just one more question here from uh, Steve. You mentioned the, um, Nigel, you mentioned Blackwood Valley. Could you just elaborate on where, where that is and when? And, and what the, the type of wines that you make from there? Yeah, Black, Blackwood Valley is just bordering Margaret River, so it's more inland. So instead of the ocean influence, you've got it's very continental. So you've got huge temperature range. You've got hot days and cool nights, really hot days and really cool nights. Um, <laughs> and it, it just gives you very intense grapes again. So I'm doing a Shiraz and a Cabernet from Blackwood Valley. And it's just very, uh, how do I describe it? V very raw um, and very intense, but it, it's got a, it's really hard to describe. It's, um, you have to try it to believe it. It's. Yeah, they're big wines, aren't they? They're, they're huge wines and um it's a region that no one's really come across but i, I don't know why because yeah. it's beautiful fruit so it's if, if you try it you'll buy it again but it's just no, no one can find it it's, it's a really yeah that that is a hidden gem um and jonathan asks both of you what are the two big goals for 2020 now first luke Oh, to get through vintage is the first goal. So we're just coming out of vintage and, and literally my mind goes from, you know, running a business to all about making wine day in, day out. And then I'm right in that transition period where I've got to uh, basically come out and start running the business again. So goals for this year, I guess it's just around adapting, um, it's going to be a different marketplace when we when we leave all of this COVID situation. Um, we've already adapted quite a bit. We're doing a lot more online stuff like this. Um, and really, I think it will change things. So adapting our businesses to cope with, with the, the next 12 months uh, is going to be crucial. 
obviously there won't be any as much travel this year. I mean, there won't be um, probably looking, won't be coming up to Sydney, won't be doing some tastings, won't be going overseas, all of that sort of thing. So just getting through the next 12 months, I think would be the, the biggest achievement. All right. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think 2020 sucks. I'm, I'm looking forward to 2021. Um, I'm, I'm just, yeah, really trying to survive 2020 and then try and build markets for 2021. And we had, I don't know about you, Nige, but we had uh, our crop levels this year were probably 50% down on, on, on average, which is a, you know, vintage for me was, there was a lot of, great fruit but some disappointing crops which is uh you know coming out of it on top of covid was a real challenge so yeah that's going to be something to deal with for the next 12 months yeah Mar margaret river was probably 20 30 percent down yeah. so yeah another tiny vintage like last year and the year before mm. fantastic guys thank you very much um we've pretty much come to the end of the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to quickly run through one of the most enviable parts of my job is, is uh, tasting a lot of wine. Um, a lot of new winemakers, new samples, pre-bottling samples, bottling samples, um, making sure all the wines are um, uh, up, to, up to the angel standards. And so um, I just thought I'd quickly run through the, the bin before I jumped on here and picked out a few wines that um, really sung to me. So first wine, the Rabbit in Spaghetti TMG 2018. Um, it will be hitting the store pretty soon, probably in a week or so um, from Adam Barton, a uh, blend of Tempranillo, Mataro, Grenache, um, 2018 vintage, blend of Clare Valley and um, Barossa Valley. And as Nigel, as you were saying before, that the blend here makes uh, just a really impeccable wine. You get all the different parts. So the Tempranillo, adding a bit of spice and the Mataro, a bit of spice. And, you know, they, they, they really complement each other and make this amazing, amazingly um, tasty, tasty wine. Um, second wine, the Rod East Hope Pinot Gris 2019. Uh, Rod the God, as we like to call him at Naked Wines. Um, Hawks Bay Pinot Gris. Um, it's a, it's a stunning wine. It's got this lovely balance, um, acidity and, and fruit. It's got real intense green pear. Um, it's almost sli sli slippery. It just, it's so easy to drink. Um, and it's just that lovely balance, uh, of acidity and, and fruit. It's, it's an absolute cracker. Um, again, that'll be on the site probably in the next week or so. Um, and then finally, um, the Army of Grapes Shiraz 2019. Um, Paul Nelson, uh, Franklin River Shiraz. Um, this wine is cool climate Shiraz, so spicy, black pepper, um, phenomenal wine. Again, really plays this, dances this really amazing dance with the acidity and the fruit. It's really, really drinkable. Um, a wine that you just want to keep drinking and drinking and drinking. Um, it's, it, and it's, it's an interesting wine because Paul, um, when he first started, had a, a Shiraz Tempranillo, I believe, and then it transitioned into a Shiraz Grenache and then a straight Grenache. And he's gone all the way around and up and down, uh, listening to all the feedback from angels. And I hope, I think he's hit the nail on the head with this wine. It's, um, it, it's a cracker. Um, and that's pretty much it. So um, thank you guys for your time and all your information. Um, it was very informative. Uh, no, and thank, so you. You. thank you, Angels, too. Like, um, this naked journey has been very interesting. And, yeah, I, I think it's real. Like, what, what the Angels give us makes, like, we are boutique wineries, and you guys get really interesting good value wines and and we get to survive and and hopefully flourish <laughs> good on you 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for, for joining joining us tonight. I uh, hope, hope you learned something and uh, got a bit of entertainment from us talking about you know things that we're all really passionate about. So um, this is what Naked Wines is all about. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, as as they said, thanks for 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 tuning in, guys, and hopefully. Well, we'll be back next week. Um, Kate and Nina will be doing something a little bit different for everyone, uh, but it should be good fun. So um, please make sure you register and, and join us next next Thursday. Thursday. All right. Cheers. See you later, guys. Thanks. Ta-da. Ta-da.